Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Bauer. I'm the Manager of Educational Events at the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar, The Biology of Pancreatic Cancer. I just want to start by telling you a little bit about us. The Pancreatic Cancer Action Network's national headquarters are located in Manhattan Beach, California, and we have a government affairs office in Washington, D.C. Our organization fulfills its mission through a nationwide network of people dedicated to working together to advance research, support patients, and create hope for those affected by pancreatic cancer. For more information about our organization, please visit our website at pancan.org. Our webinar is scheduled for 60 minutes today with a presentation followed by a Q&A session. What you can see for the Q&A portion of the presentation, please type your question for the presenter in the question and answer box. It is highlighted in yellow on the current slide to direct you there. If you do not have it on your screen, simply hit the Q&A button on the top to bring it up. We will have our question moderator read the questions at the end of the presentation. Please keep your question as general as possible, and we will try to get to as many as we can. However, please note, depending on the nature of the questions submitted, we will not be able to answer all questions during this webinar. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Dr. Lynn Matrizian is Vice President of Scientific and Medical Affairs for the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. Lynn received a Ph.D. in Molecular Biology from the University of Arizona and put her scientific training to work over the past 25 years, leading a research laboratory dedicated to understanding cancer metastasis. She has published more than 200 original scientific articles and trained more than 30 young scientists who have gone on to join the fight against cancer. Lynn was the founding chair of the Department of Cancer Biology in the School of Medicine at Vanderbilt University, the president of the American Association for Cancer Research, and a special assistant to the director of the National Cancer Institute at the National Institutes of Health. Lynn, I will now turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Chris. It's really a pleasure to be here today and to talk about it to everyone about the biology of pancreatic cancer. So when we think about, when we hear in the media about cancer, a lot of times we hear about the big four cancers. And when they're talking about that, they're talking about lung, breast, prostate, and colon cancer. And they call them the big four because they have very high incidence. In other words, there's a lot of people in the United States who get those four cancers. But when we think about the cancers that cause the most deaths from cancer in the United States, we really need to think about five cancers, and we need to include pancreatic cancer in that. So even though it ranks about 10th in terms of the number of cases, it ranks fourth at the moment in the number of cancer deaths in a year from pancreatic cancer. Um, and you can see in the slide in front of you, um, that that is, is going to change over the next couple years, that the number of cases from pancreatic cancer is actually going to increase, um, whereas the number of deaths from lung cancer, breast, colon, and prostate cancer are decreasing or remaining the same. So this information is from a report that we released earlier this year, and we were quite stunned by, by these numbers. And what, what's really quite remarkable is that, that these, the rates are decreasing for these other four cancers, but increasing for pancreatic cancer. Now, why are they decreasing? Well, it's because we are doing such a good job of treating and detecting these other cancers earlier so that our treatments are more effective. Um, and so what we need to do now is use those same resources, that same ability to impact the number of deaths in these other cancers um, and, and place that on pancreatic cancer. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to do it um, by what I call a, a, a knowledge diamond. What we really want to do is impact um, clinical practice. We want to change our ability 
um, how we treat pancreatic cancer. In order to do that, we need to know how to make our current treatments better. So we need to do clinical research. We need to ask whether something new is better than what we already have. And in order to even know what to ask could be better, we really have to build that on a big base of basic research, of basic understanding of the biology of, um, of pancreatic cancer. So there's the biology forms the real basis of this. We use that knowledge. We take it through a stage of research called translational research, where we use that knowledge, um, translate it into a form that we can do now clinical research, do clinical trials, and ask whether the next treatment is better, and can we now put that into clinical practice and treat patients with that. So what we can do is, is then take that knowledge, expand it up through this pyramid. Okay, so let's start then with what we know about the biology of pancreatic cancer. We'll start big, we'll start with the organ. It's an organ that's deep within within the body, um, and that um, presents challenges in terms of you can't really feel it, so you can't really tell if there's a lump in it or not. Pancreas is located kind of below the stomach and the liver, above the small intestine and the large intestine. And it's an interesting organ. It's one organ. Here's a picture of the pancreas. But interestingly, um, it has two functions. And it has a digestive function. It makes enzymes that digest our food. And it also has an endocrine function, which means it makes hormones, and in particular the hormone insulin, which regulates the sugar levels, the glucose levels in our bloodstream. And it even gets more complicated because there's three major cell types within the pancreas. So one organ, two functions, three cell types. Two of these cell types are related to this function of making enzymes that digest food, and those are acinar cells. So these are these pretty purple cells here that are actually making the enzymes that digest our food. And the ductal cells, which are little um, tubes that run through the pancreas that takes those enzymes, puts them into our small intestine, and allows them to digest food. So the, set, the other type of cells is related to the endocrine function, and those are the islet cells, and they're the ones that make insulin and other hormones related to glucose metabolism. So what happens then when the pancreas gets cancer? So here's a picture. Um, these are our slides, so slices of the pancreas looking at the cells that make up that particular organ. And on this side, what I'm highlighting here is the ductal cells. So these are the cells that make this tube, the straw, that go through the pancreas um, and deliver the enzymes that are made by these acinar cells into this tube so that they then collect and go into the small intestine. And there's about 20 or 25 or so cells that are lining this tube. And you can tell because you can count each of these little round dots. These are called nuclei. They're in the center of each cell. You can count them. And those are making, in essence, this section of um, the duct. The islet cells are little, as their name suggests, little islands of cells, so these light pink cells that are clustered throughout the pancreas. So when the pancreas gets cancer, it can be either in these ductal cells, and that leads to pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, or it can be in these islet cells, which is, oops, sorry about that, um, which is, which are these, so these islet cells become cancer, and that leads to pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, or, 
or sometimes we call it PNET. So either of these cell types can become cancer. And when they do so, if you look at the difference between um, this nice little cluster of cells here, which is all kind of organized and all has a nice little boundary, what happens when it becomes cancer is then it it grows and becomes disorganized. So now it doesn't know that it's supposed to stay in this nice little circle and be a little island of cells. It starts spreading throughout the organ. And the same thing happens with pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, where these ductal cells, they're still trying to make ducts, but they're spreading throughout the organ. Um, they're coming very disorganized. They no longer can carry enzymes into, um, into the small intestine, and it loses its ability to really to function very well. So what happens is that the digestive enzymes get messed up when we have pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, and the hormones get messed up when we have pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Now, most of the pancreatic cancer um, that occurs, about 95% of it is this form, the ductal adenocarcinoma, and about 5% is the neuroendocrine tumors. So what's actually happening when we take these nice organized cells and now they become very disorganized and start to grow? Well, we're going to start with a little normal cell, and this can be a ductal cell or an islet cell. And something happens, and on these slides I have it as a lightning bolt that comes down and, um, and causes a change in that particular cell. And that change results in the ability of that cell to grow more than it's supposed to. And we'll talk about that in, in a little bit more detail in a moment. But it can form a tumor that's called a benign tumor. And a benign tumor is not life-threatening. Um, it, it uh, it's a growth. It's, for instance, on your skin, it would be like a wart, which would not really be a big deal. But it then has the possibility of another lightning bolt coming down and changing those cells so that it now becomes malignant. And in this case, it is it does become cancer. It can then accumulate additional changes, and the cancer can start to invade into surrounding tissues um, the, in other parts of the pancreas, and, and eventually it can metastasize so that it can actually go to other organs um, within the body. So this is very unusual for cells. Our cells certainly norm, do not normally um, start wandering around to other parts um, of the body. So what's actually happening here? What, is, what are these lightning bolts? Well, we know in some cases, for instance, in the case of skin cancer, that things like UV irradiation from the sun actually cause cancer. They cause damage to the cell, and they cause them to undergo this progression, this change from normal to benign to malignant to metastatic. We know in the case of lung cancers that there's carcinogens in things that cause cancer in cigarette smoke, and that that is actually a cause of cancer. For prostate and breast cancer, it's not quite so clear exactly what causes the cancer, but we know that there's a hormonal component so that hormones play an, a, a role in actually causing these cells to grow and progress to cancer. And in pancreatic cancer, it's even a little more mysterious to us as to what actually causes the cancer. We know that smoking and obesity are risk factors so that they increase the possibility of getting it, but they do not themselves cause the cancer. But sometimes when a, a cell is dividing and growing and making new cells, and our cells do that all the time, the cells that you were born with, the cells that you have now are not the cells you were born with, except for a, a very few specialized cells that do remain with us our whole life. But most of those cells turn over on a sometimes daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. And so we have new cells. And as they turn over, as one cell makes two 
two daughter cells. Um, sometimes mistakes just happen. So we have to be very, um, whenever one cell makes a couple cells, it has to be absolutely perfect in its ability um, to do that. It is perfect 99.999% of the time, but every now and then um, a mistake happens. And that seems to be what appears um, for cancer. So what is this mistake that's actually happening? Well, it's a, it's a mutation in the DNA. The, um, the, our genetic code, um, we get half of our DNA from our mother and half of our DNA from our father. And it's these series of four bases, TCGA, that um, is the language of our genetic code. And it's the sequence of them, what order they're in, that has information in it. And that information the cell uses to determine what it's supposed to do and where it's supposed to go. So a mutation comes in, and it changes. This particular DNA is being read as cat. And all of a sudden, it changes that C to a G. And now it's being read as gat. And it, the cell doesn't know what that is says, hmm, I used to know what this was, and I don't know what it is now. So the DNA is our master plan. That is really the, the information that's within each of our, each of our the cells of our body. And it tells the cell to make protein. The protein is, in essence, the raw materials that, are, that makes up most of our body. And it's this combination of DNA plus protein that's important for a cell. So that's the part. That's the building block that makes up um, an organ and makes up the organs make up the whole, our body. So we have this cell. It's got DNA in the middle. It's got protein around it. Our lightning bolt comes down, changes the DNA, so it now reads something that's, that's different than what it's supposed to be normally. The, the protein then is different, that is made, that is coded, but it is informed by that DNA. So now because the DNA is different, the protein's different, and now the cell behaves differently. So we've, in essence, changed some of the raw material within that cell. That protein is different, and it, it reacts differently. It behaves differently um, because of this change. So how does it behave differently? Well, there are what we call hallmarks of cancer. So there are the way a cell behaves normally gets changed in certain ways when it becomes cancer. And this is a, a diagram that, talk, that shows some of the different ways that, um, that a, a normal cell would behave that is then misregulated in cancer. So a normal cell would, would in essence be an idol. It would be sitting there, and it would have to receive a signal to tell it to grow. A cancer cell can, in essence, have that, that change, that going from cat to gat, can be a signal that says, go ahead and grow. Don't wait for somebody to tell you to grow. Just go ahead and grow. Our, our normal cells um, will have signals when it's time to die. They will die and be eliminated, and a new cell will, will replace it. Uh, cancer cells can ignore that signal to die. Cancer cells can ignore signals that tell it not to grow anymore. It can receive signals that tell it it's OK to live forever. And it can receive signals that tell it that it's OK to spread around the body. So these are all things that they would normally control, but that they, they gets changed and loses that control um, as cancer occurs. So. We have our little cell here, and it's gotten a mutation in the DNA. And now, for instance, if we pretend that cell is like a car, it now gets a signal. It has a change, and it says, step on the gas. So now it's going fast, um, but it's still stopping at all the stop signs. Um, but it's going pretty fast down the highway. Well, now it gets another signal, and it says, oh, you don't have to stop at the stop signs anymore. 
So now it gets a little bit more dangerous. And then it gets signals that say things like, you can disconnect the brakes, that your gas tank is endless, and that you can go off-road. So it's those kinds of changes, those kinds of, of signals that the cell is getting that are cumulative. So it's kind of a one change can lead to more changes. That is why we get this progression from a normal cell to a benign tumor, a malignant tumor, and then one that's capable of metastasizing. So that's the, the underlying biology as to why cancer occurs and why, why that makes the cells act differently. So what do we do about it? Well, the way that we treat cancer really depends on where the cells are located, where the cancer actually is. And if it's localized, if it's in the pancreas only, and if it's in just a, a small part of the pancreas, then it can be surgically resected. It can be removed by surgery. Um, and that, um, and that's what we, that's, that's the most effective way of treating pancreatic cancer. If it's a little bit more, if it's spread a little bit farther, it can include radiation therapy. So that's when it gets a little bit farther, it's a little more regional. You need a broader um, area to cover to find those cancer cells and kill them. Then radiation therapy is added. And if it's systemic, if it has moved to other parts of the body, then, radi then surgery and radiation aren't going to be able to get those cells that are farther away. Um, and so it's treated with chemotherapy. So that means it's put into the, the bloodstream. And, um, but our standard chemotherapy targets growing dividing cells. So, the, the actual ability to, of those cells to continue to grow. And therefore, it has some side effects because it, it will um, also harm any other growing dividing cells um, in the body because it's given throughout the whole body. So what, how do we then get better therapy? So this is, this is, in essence, the way that we treat pancreatic cancer now. If we want to get better therapies, then we need to do a clinical trial. We need to have a new idea. We need to test that idea um, with or without what we currently have, what we're currently using, and see if it's any better. So it's called the standard of care, the way we would normally treat pancreatic cancer at that particular stage of disease, whether it's local, regional, or metastatic. And so there's always treatment, there's always the best that we have, but then there's the chance of, of trying something new and seeing if you add that to our standard of care, whether it's better. And this graph says, yes, something is better. So um, these, this shows the, the um, number of people that are alive over time, and what you see is there's more people alive in this pink line than there are in the blue line. So the, we've added something to this treatment, and it's now better than what we had. So that's what we want. We want this new standard of care, a new treatment that's better um, than what we currently have. Now, for pancreatic cancer, Unfortunately, we've, we've been trying. There's been a lot of clinical trials, and sometimes there's just a little bit of difference, and we're excited, and that helps, and that's good. Um, but what we would really like is to have a, a really a treatment that's much better than what we have now. So the people are trying. There's in in um, last year, there were 129 clinical trials in the United States for pancreatic cancer. There's, there's usually, a, at any one time, there's usually about 115 or so um, clinical trials that are open for pancreatic cancer. And they're the ones that were open in 2011 asked some specific questions. About 11% of them were 
particularly focused on the, the neuroendocrine type of pancreatic cancer. Can we treat that better? Or can we try um, a, new, a new idea and see if we can make um, treatment for, for the neuroendocrine type any better? There was about a third of the clinical trials that were open were asking if we can make what we have better. Can we, is there new radiation? Can we make it um, stronger and more focused so that it doesn't have as much damage to any surrounding tissue? Can we take some of those chemotherapy drugs and can we add something to it that makes them um, deliver much better, to last longer, to hit the cancer more appropriately? And can can we just change how we give it or um, the sequence in which we give it? Can we do modifications that make what we have much better? About 11% of those trials were asking if we can turn our own immune system against that cancer. Can we beef it up so that our natural immune system will be much better at attacking that cancer um, than it is currently? So uh, a percentage of the trials were looking specifically at that. And then the most trials, and um, totaling about 40, um, 38 percent, almost 40 percent of the trials, that were really trying to take advantage of what we've learned about the biology of pancreatic cancer. So what we learned about the things I was just telling you about, about the mutations and how that changes the behavior of the cells, and what are the proteins that actually control that. And so this is really something that people are, are very excited about and very hopeful that by understanding the biology, we'll be able to really translate that information into these kinds of clinical trials. And we're now testing to see if they'll really make um, the treatment any better. So this is how we're going to be smarter. We're going to understand these mutations that occur in the DNA. We're going to understand how they affect the protein and the cell behavior. And we're going to make a drug that stops it, that simply says, okay, we know how what this protein is. We know how it's different. And we're either going to attack that protein directly or we're going to attack something that's required for it to actually change the cancer cell behavior. And so the pharmaceutical companies and the biotech companies are trying lots of different ways. They're looking at really all these different hallmarks of cancer, the way that cancer is different from normal, and trying to understand those molecules. Um, those proteins that are different, making drugs that specifically target them and that will um, then be able to be applied to pancreatic cancer and, um, and hopefully really make a difference. So this is the way that clinical trials are just starting to be done in pancreatic cancer, um, is that, that a there is all patients have pancreatic cancer in this case, but some of them have a pink mutation, some of them have a GAT, and some of them have a, a don't have that mutation, and they have something else that that um, that caused, made a difference for those. For, for in that particular cancer. And so then they can ask specifically, does the drug that targets that mutation, that targets the GAT mutation, work for patients that have that mutation? Um, and it should work much better for those patients, and it should, in essence, not work for these patients. And so then you can really give the right drug to the right person. And the bottom line is, yes, this has worked in a number of cancer types now. It's worked in leukemia, breast cancer, melanoma, and it's being tested in a lot. So we really think it's going, it's going to work in pancreatic cancer. We have to be, um, we keep on trying. As I said, 38% of the trials that are ongoing are testing this idea. They've got a lot of different ideas, different um, approaches to take to really try to understand what caused that cancer, and therefore, if we can reverse that by using a drug that's specifically directed to that. So that's how 
scientists, clinicians are trying to use what they know about the biology of pancreatic cancer and apply it to really make a difference in the disease. So our goal of the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network is to um, advocate for doubling the survival from pancreatic cancer by 2020. Um, and again, the way that we're going to do that is by increasing, we have a, a number of different approaches that of how we're going to do this. We're going to try to really increase um, the activity in this triangle. So through our PALS program, Patient and Liaison Services program, um, we're supporting patients and their families, and we're giving them information on clinical trials. So if there is a trial that's appropriate, that perhaps they can help us um, know what whether a new idea is going to work, whether it's going to be better to really test that in clinical trials. And we have lots of information on those trials. We keep it very updated and can be a really good resource for patients when they want the, that kind of information. We building this this knowledge, this research in the clinical, translational, and basic research areas is critical um, for being able to double the survival. And we do that two ways. We raise um, funds ourselves, and we have a very nice grants program. We're giving $4 million in grants this year to scientists who are studying pancreatic cancer specifically and adding to the knowledge and the clinical trials that are going to be critical um, to make these advances. And we've been advocating in Washington, D.C. With, um, with some very exciting results lately so that the government um, continues and um, even does a better job of putting its resources towards um, attacking pancreatic cancer. And then this, of course, is all very much dependent on our affiliate network, mobilize the troops, um, everybody's aware of pancreatic cancer, to build the, um, the infrastructure, the resources that we need to accomplish this goal of really taking this biology, taking it to the top of this pyramid and making a difference for pancreatic cancer patients. So that's my um, kind of summary and overview of uh, what happens in cancer and how it's relevant to um, how we're approaching pancreatic cancer today, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Batrizian. Once again, we're going to have our moderator read the questions. Um, I do want to note, though, as I said at the beginning, we did receive uh, many questions that might be better suited for you to take back to your uh, medical team. So once again, if we don't answer that question today, that is the reason. But now I will turn it over to the moderator so we can um, have some of your questions answered. Thank you. Our first question for Dr. Matrizian, why is the incidence of pancreatic cancer expected to increase so much? So there's a, a number of reasons. One is that, so incidence is the number of cases, right? So um, we're, we're just looking at the, the number of people in a year who are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So one thing that is happening is that people are living longer, and that's a really good thing. We're not, we have done a really good job of controlling infectious diseases, controlling heart diseases, um, and controlling a lot of other diseases. So our life expectancy is much longer. Cancer is a disease where you have increased risk of getting cancer the older you are. And it's because of this accumulation of mutations that I was talking about, where it takes more than one thing to happen, and that takes time. So as we get as the population gets older, more people are living longer so that they will end up getting cancer in general, and pancreatic cancer will be among those. Um, there's also some changes in, um, th there's a change in the rate. There does seem to be some um, effect of obesity. Um, it's 
well known now that our nation is becoming heavier, and that's going to have some effect. But that's really a, a pretty small part of it. We know that there's many other factors and that, um, that contribute to pancreatic cancer. So that may be one of them, um, but it's not the only one. The, the big one is really because um, we're, we're living longer, we're not dying of other causes, uh, and that is um, giving us more time to develop cancer. Thank you very much. Our next question, why is pancreatic cancer so deadly? It seems like the drugs to treat the, the disease just don't work very well. So what is different about it to make it so hard to treat? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so there's a couple things that make it very hard. Um, those, those mutations that occur in pancreatic cancer um, are a little different than, and, a, and um, there's one that's really important in pancreatic cancer, and that's a mutation that's in a gene that's called KRAS, R-A-S, RAS. Um, and RAS has been particularly hard for cancer biologists to to figure out how to make a drug to kill RAS. And they've been working on it for many, for a long time. We've known about that this is a, a mutation that's it's in a lot of cancers, but it's in a higher percentage of pancreatic cancer than other cancers. Um, and so we just haven't been able to make a drug yet that attacks RAS. So I think that's one reason, is that our drugs have um, we haven't really found um, the right targeted therapy for pancreatic cancer. But then why doesn't our other therapies that target, that, um, that help control rapidly growing cells, why don't they work in pancreatic cancer? Well, we think it has to do with the fact, and um, can I go back in the slides? I think I can. Um, let me show you the... This picture here of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, the, the more common form of pancreatic cancer. And what you'll see is that because it started as in these duct cells, that there we find these duct cells in here, but we also find a lot of what we call stroma or connective tissue, this other kind of tissue that's in this cancer. And that probably comes from normally these ducts would be sitting in this connective tissue. And this is just kind of the structure that helps keep that duct in place. Um, and that grows as well. And so we think what what ha what the consequence of that is that the drugs that we have don't seem to get to those cancer cells nearly as easily as they do when you just have lots and lots of just those cells, when you don't have all this connective tissue, the stroma that kind of gets in the way um, of getting the drugs to these cells. So we think that that's another um, reason why um, pancreatic cancer in particular has been so resistant to the types of therapies that we have. And there are a number of clinical trials that are ongoing that are really specifically addressing that problem. Why, what can we do to open up this so that we can get the drugs in there better? Um, and so we're um, interested and excited about um, about seeing the results of those trials to see if um, if that is an approach that will really work. And then perhaps the drugs that we're using now will work much better. And then as we get better drugs that actually attack the cancer cells, cells themselves, they'll even work better because we'll be able to get more of them into those, into those cancer cells. Thank you. Can you now describe for us how long it takes for cancer to form and spread from a precancerous stage into cancer and then through the different stages of pancreatic cancer? So it takes um, a matter of years. So there have been, it can be, it can start with um, small changes that can then 
really not cause any damage, but can sit there for, for many years, 20 years even. Um, and before the next event occurs. So again, if we look at this, the time between going from this stage to this stage, um, so this stage happens, and then it can sit there as this benign tumor for many years before the next event occurs and it pushes it forward. Um, so it is, um, cancer in general is, takes and that's one, again, one reason why as we get older, we become more susceptible to it is because then there's enough time for this accumulation of events. So it can really be years um, in, in the making, in, in essence, before it's really um, detected. Thank you very much. Our next question, can you discuss the state of practice at the current time of gene therapy for pancreatic cancer? Yeah, um, there is really um, not much of what was classically considered gene therapy um, going on. Um, the, the gene therapy um, revolution of, of a number of years ago, a decade or so ago, um, ended up causing cancer. So people were trying to put genes into, to, to correct defects in genes, um, mutations in genes that were um, mutations that 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 person was born with, that they were in the DNA um, from their parents. And um, there was a lot of interest in correcting those mutations. Um, and ways were developed to get the right gene in those cells. Um, and clinical trials were done with that, and it worked. But what ended up happening is the process of putting the right gene back into those cells actually ended up causing cancer, in particular um, leukemias and blood cancers. So there is, so a lot of that research was stopped from that perspective. So the real problem is how you get the right gene in there. Um, and that's, that's just been really, um, we haven't, Scientists are still working on it, but they haven't worked out how to do that effectively and safely. And that's why the real interest these days come from making a, a drug, a small molecule, a chemical that will, in essence, um, affect the way that that the way that a protein works, rather than trying to go back and correct the DNA. Um, so right now, that has been the most effective way of approaching um, what we know happens to a gene, but what we're actually, but what we can actually do about it, we do downstream of that gene. We do it at the protein level, and we do it in, in a way to change cell behavior rather than actually trying to correct um, the gene itself, the mutation in the gene, because that um, thus far we've just had a, a hard time figuring out how to do that effectively and safely. Still on the table, but but um, but it'll be a while. Thank you very much. We have a number of questions here about early detection and screening for pancreatic cancer. Can you talk about what's currently available for early detection and where we're moving in that in that area? Sure. The um, so the the hope is that again because you can't really feel your pancreas and so you can't do you know a self exam mm -hmm. or something like that that we can come up with better ways to um, be able to detect it early and there's really um, the best way to start would be to have some sort of blood test or perhaps a urine test that you could you could test. Um, along the way um, every so often and see whether um, there's any indicators that there's pancreatic cancer. Um, there are a number of research projects that are looking at that. What they do is they start with people who have pancreatic cancer and compare it to people who don't. And they, there is a number of very interesting molecules that are 
found in the bloodstream, in the blood of people or the urine of people who have pancreatic cancer and those that do not. And now the question is, can you take that back? Can you step back so that when there's just a little tumor just starting, that you can detect that? And right now, that's where we're at. There are scientists that have, that know, that are asking that question. Can we find the, the, the pancreatic cancer when it's very small? And that's actually a very hard question to answer because we don't know that somebody has pancreatic cancer until they're diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So we can't, it's hard to find the people to say, well, this person has a very small tumor or this person is going to get pancreatic cancer to know whether um, our methods are good enough to be able to do that. Now that said, there's a lot of, um, there are some interesting um, groups that can be looked at that have a, a, um, a higher risk of getting pancreatic cancer. So if they are followed long term over a long period of time, that we have a chance of, of knowing whether those tests work or not. Um, and so again, it's, it's in the research stage. Um, there is a lot of times a lot of interest and excitement about finding a marker. Um, but it's the really hard part then is is to knowing whether that's going to be useful really for early detection. Now the second thing is then once you start to know whether there's, um, if, if you can then have a group that is at high risk for getting pancreatic cancer, then the other thing you can do is really look at the pancreas. See if, see if you can see changes in the pancreas that tell you that there's a, a physical change rather than looking for, in essence, a molecular change in the blood. Um, and there's some interesting approaches to that. There are some, some real advances in our ability to image for a molecular imaging. So, um, so a, for instance, an MRI, those kinds of assays are looking for anatomical changes, so changes in really structure, um, whether there's a lump or not. Um, there are now, for instance, a PET scan is a looking at, in essence, the biology. It's looking at whether there's a lot of sugar being taken up by, by, um, by a certain tissue. And that's a more of a molecular change. And um, that usually if more sugar is being taken up by a tissue, a lot of times that suggests to the, to the physician that that could be cancer rather than something that's benign. That's one of, one of the differences, although it isn't always 100%. So people are taking that idea and they're saying, okay, well, maybe we can um, find something specific that's different between pancreatic cancer and the that's different from the normal pancreas around it, and we'll put some sort of light or some sort of um, radioactive material even, and some, some sort of tag on that so that it'll light up when we look at it. And there's some, again, very interesting research that's being done. Um, right now it's in mice, and uh, but a way of lighting up a, a pancreatic cancer tumor um, that would look different from the normal pancreas and that would then be able to, to show us at a much earlier level rather than waiting to actually become big enough to see a ball of cells. We could actually see it when it's a much smaller group of cells. Um, and so, again, that's in the research stage. But there are um, research that's, that's going on for both of those to try to find a blood test that could be used broadly and to try to find an imaging test that would be used as the next step to see whether there was actually a change in the pancreas itself. Thank you very much. Um, there have also been a number of questions about familial pancreatic cancer or the hereditary risk of developing pancreatic cancer. Can you discuss that in its current state and where there might be some research being done?
Yes, there are a, um, several mutations that we know of that are, um, so the mutations I've been talking about are mutations in the cells themselves. The, the hereditary kind of mutations are ones that were, in essence, passed on from your father or your mother. So those are called germline mutations. So they are in every cell of your body as opposed to these mutations that are this lightning bolt mutations occur in the cell that's going to give rise to the cancer. So there are um, genes that we know of. One of them is the BRCA2 gene um, that is that is that gives rise to breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and in some cases pancreatic cancer that um, increases the probability of getting pancreatic cancer. Now again, it doesn't cause it itself, um, but it is, it's in essence one of those lightning bolts and you need several of them. So one by itself is not enough, um, but in essence it's already, it's, a, it's about like half of a lightning bolt maybe. <laughs> you need You need the other half of that and you need other lightning bolts to occur in order for that to to, to be to get pancreatic cancer but it is again it's it's a, a partial step along that that pathway and that's why um, why there's an increased uh, risk of getting pancreatic cancer because of those genes so there's about four or five different um, genes that we know of that um, where there are hereditary um, and familial, mutations that can be passed from generation to generation that increase that risk. Um, and so we, we are trying to um, identify as many of them as we can so that people will know their risk. Um, and we would be able to tell a brother or a sister whether they're, whether they have that change or not and whether they there are therefore at higher risk or not. Um, and then, the there isn't quite well there is sometimes a way to also take that knowledge and use it for some of the drugs that you might treat that patient with and that is still um, under investigation but for instance the BRCA2 mutations um, might be more susceptible to a, a certain kind of drug that's current, currently in clinical trials for pancreatic cancer as well as for other cancers and those trials are trying to select those cases of pancreatic cancer that have mutations in BRCA2 and to see whether that hypothesis is correct whether those drugs really work quite well in patients who have that as um, as part of these changes that have occurred in their particular cancer. Thank you. Um, our next question is, can you discuss why there are so few symptoms of pancreatic cancer? So the, it, it, the symptoms are really, um, a lot of times occur when the cancer blocks that duct that leads into the into the small intestine and it starts to affect there's a connection there also with the bile duct and you can get and it so then it'll start to affect the delivery of bile into the small intestine so some of the consequences of that uh, is um, jaundice, so a, a yellowing of the the skin and the eyes, and that's a um, because that it isn't working quite quite right there. So that's when there are symptoms. A lot of times, it's it's because um, you've actually block the the delivery of um, those enzymes into the small intestine. If that cancer occurs back farther in the organ, so back where it, it's not really affecting the ability of the bile to get into the into the duct and to go into the into the small intestine, um, then it's 
then it then you don't have that symptom and then there they really don't have any symptoms because you're making enough enzymes with the rest of the pancreas to actually um, to to digest your food so you don't see that as a symptom there's enough islet cells that are working so you don't have any hormonal changes um, in that case so you don't really see see those symptoms until that cancer gets big enough that it does start to affect the ability to make the enzymes that digest the food, the ability to make the hormones that um, that regulate glucose. So that is, um, it's really kind of where that cancer occurs within the, the um, pancreas that um, determines how early those symptoms are seen. Great. Thank you very much. We have one last question here. When people have pancreatic cancer and then die of the disease, is there any type of survey that's done on the patients to be entered in some type of database or tracked to see if there's links between victims of the disease? Um, certainly, we, there are, you know, records. Are we, you know, records of cause of death. But in terms of specifically, there are two places in the United States that do extensive research on patients shortly after their death. Um, and that one's at, one's at Johns Hopkins and one's at University of Nebraska. Um, so they are trying to learn as much about the disease from those, from those patients. Um, as they can. Um, in terms of other, looking at other, um, for instance, lifestyles or, or things like that that might link um, different pancreatic cancer patients, that is in the realm of epidemiology. So people who look at um, populations and they try very hard to look at what's different between this group of people who got and died of pancreatic cancer versus another you know another group the same age who didn't um, and they're trying to pull information out of that but I, th I think you're really asking um, more about you know specific links um, between those patients, and I don't, I don't think we're actually doing um, specifically what you're asking. But there's a lot of research that's being done around in different parts of that uh, of the uh, of those patients. Okay, thank you again very much, Dr. Matrizian. If your question wasn't addressed today, or if you have additional questions, please contact our Patient Liaison Services Department at eight seven seven. 272-6226 and ask to speak with a PALS associate. Dr. Matrizian's PowerPoint presentation and recording of this webinar will be available on our website at pancan.org under educational events. You will also find information on our next free webinar on January 10th, Clinical Trials, A Physician's Perspective. After today's webinar, you will receive an email with a survey link. You need the confirmation code in the email to submit your responses but we appreciate your feedback. This concludes our webinar. Thank you for joining us today.